That is, Scott, that's got to be the most extensive introduction I've ever received. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Bear with me. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. I'm really, really glad that you're here. Um, today, we are going to talk about um, symbols and how those connect us in our relationships and particularly about um, how important it is or how important it's not that you and the others you're in relationships with, whether it's it's business, romantic, uh, familial, um, how important it is you agree on those symbols. So I want everyone to take just a minute and I want you to just look around your immediate surroundings and I want you to identify, just count up as, as many symbols as you can that you surround yourself with right now. Um, while you're doing that, I'm gonna collect a couple of symbols that I keep in my office Just a, a couple that are within arm's reach of me. So if you take a couple seconds and do that and you start counting up, um, I, I guess since, since nobody else is live on this, Scott, I'm just gonna ask you how many did you count up? Sorry, um, just in this room I counted three. Um, yeah, yeah, um, they are all over the place. Um, you can even get down to, I'm, I'm looking at brand name things on my desk right now, like a roll of scotch tape, oh, yeah. um, disinfectant wipes, like symbols take all sorts of, of, of forms. Um, I'm going to share three symbols that I keep on. I was on just my looking at my personal symbols. There's about 50 if I count, you know, the, right. the Gatorade bottle. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to share a couple of my personal symbols and talk about why I keep them around and then we're going to, um, we're going to get into why those symbols are important. So the first one here. Um, this is a framed quote, um, and this medallion is from my CSAT training. Um, it says, answer the call. Um, and, and the quote is from Joseph Campbell. It says, if you can see your path laid out in front of you step by step, you know that it's not your path. Your own path you make with every step you take. That's why it's your path. Um, this is an important symbol to me because when I finished my CSAT training, which to that date was one of the biggest professional accomplishments, um, you know, a dream of mine for a while. Um, I got that coin and I shared with my spouse how important it was to me. And I, I talked to her about this answer the call thing. Um, she promptly stole the medallion without my knowing. And she found this quote and had it framed. Um, so in my office, instead of having pictures of my family, this is what I have on my desk. This, this symbol here represents my spouse and um, her support and her love. And um, this, this is her sitting here with me doing this work that I care about. Um, this symbol here, the Lego Star Wars ship. Um, the reason why I keep this in my office, my, my kids every year for my birthday, they buy me a Lego set, which later becomes theirs um, after we put it together. We all, we all really love Lego. Um, and this set, um, they actually took me to the store. They said, you can buy any set you want, which meant I'll pay for any set I want to get. And that's the one that I wanted to get. And we put it together and they both said, this is too nice for you to give us. We'll just destroy it. You should put it somewhere safe. And I said, where's that? And they said, it should be in your office. So this sits in my office. Um, I look at it every day and this is in place of a picture of my, my two kids. So this reminds me of them and their care and their support. And then this other signal um, is a little keychain. It says Ogden. Ogden, Utah is my, um, it's my hometown. Um, and I'm really proud to live there. I'm proud of the community that I'm in. Um, I'm proud of what it has to offer. And so I carry that with me, um, a little piece of home I take everywhere that I take my car. Um, symbols are everywhere and we put meaning into these. If you look at any of these um, on their own, um, inherently, I don't think I could sell any of these for any significant amount of money because they don't mean to other people what they mean to me. Um, my kids, when they come in the office, the first thing they look for is to make sure that the, the, the Lego ship is still there and um, they, they ask if I've played with it recently. Um, my, my wife, every time she comes in my office, she'll look at that picture that I shared and she'll say, oh, I forgot about this. Remind me again why you keep that on her desk and I'll tell her the story again. She knows why I keep it on the desk, but it's this ritual that reinforces the meaning. Um, so for our relationships, there are symbols that surround us and, and have meaning 
for us individually and for our relationship. Um, the three universal symbols in any relationship are home, love, and money. Um, what we believe makes a home, what a home is, what we believe love is and affection is, and what we believe money is, are the three symbols that have the largest bearing on a, an intimate romantic relationship. Um, symbols help us feel connected and a sense of purpose. Um, one of the things that human beings do really, really well is we can carry abstract thought in our mind, like love or like um, marriage or commitment, but we can only carry it so far without externalizing it some way and, and having an artifact or having a symbol that represents that for us. Um, so, um, those, those three core symbols, home, love, and money, if you disagree significantly on the meaning of those symbols in your marriage or significant relationship, um, you will have conflict around that. And it will be a, a pretty, um, it'll be a pretty important conflict or a pretty consequential conflict. Um, so one, the thing that I wanna spend time on today is not what's the correct interpretation of these symbols because as I demonstrated with my symbols in my office, um, those symbols have value to me and they're, they're priceless to me because of the meaning that's associated with them. I've built that meaning. Um, I and my spouse, I and my kids, we've built that meaning. Um, my hometown actually has a reputation in the state of Utah of kind of being the, the armpit of Utah. Um, there was a meme a while ago of Mufasa the lion and Simba his son sitting on Pride Rock and looking over and, and it says, everything the light touches are the good parts of Utah. The shadow, that's Ogden. Um, and I used to feel that way until I started living there. So even when I tell people I'm from Ogden, a, a lot of times the response I'll get is, I'm so sorry. And I'll say, don't be, I love it. I don't want to live anywhere else. Um, it's all about what we put into it. Um, so it's very, very important in our relationships that number one, we understand what the symbols are that have significance for our partner and for us together. Um, so that we can honor those symbols, especially if we agree on them, like if, if your anniversary is a big deal or birthdays are a big deal. Um, in some relationships they're not, and that's fine. Um, that, that's fine as long as you agree, you know, this is just another day and we celebrate our uniqueness and we, we celebrate our relationship in other ways. As long as you agree on that, um, you can engage in the ritual of celebrating, supporting, and understanding that symbol together. And that's the importance of symbols in a relationship. Oftentimes the problem that, that couples, and I would say even like workplaces and larger organizations run into, is we try to problem solve differences in the understanding of the symbol before we take the time to really understand what's going on for the person on the other side of the table from us. Um, and if you've, if you've been to a lot of these um, uh, webinars that I've done, you'll notice that's a theme. Um, understanding is key. Seeking understanding is key before trying to reach some kind of agreement or, or some kind of a, a solution to the difference in our opinion here or the difference in the meaning here. Um, when, when it comes to these symbols, like for example, home, another story from my life. Um, when my wife and I decided to get married, we looked for a place to live together. And we looked in Ogden because that's where I was going to school and she worked for the school district there. And um, I had in my mind without, without uh, evaluating any cost benefit or trade-off that we could find a place to live for a certain amount of money a month. And it wasn't a lot because I was a student and she was a teacher, so we didn't have a lot of money. So I pulled up a bunch of apartment listings in our price range and we went and looked at them. And the way that she described each one of them is this is a scary dungeon and I don't want to live here. Um, and I said to her, um, you know, when I've, when I've lived other places, like not my parents' house, it hasn't been anything, you know, real nice. Like we're going to have to work up to that. It's just a roof over our head. That's all we need. And um, she said, how about I take over the finding the listings that we're going to go look at? And true to form with her, uh, she found something that was amazing in our price range. And as we talked about, we lived in that place for almost two years. We talk about it all the time. Um, it had this little, it had this little balcony 
above our garage and it was surrounded by trees um, and we had a view of, of the mountains from there and we put some Adirondack chairs out on the balcony and we planted some trees or not some trees some flowers that you know cascaded and spilled over and smelled really good and we'd often sit out there in the spring in the summer in the fall and we just look at the mountains and we just talk and she said this is why we need a place like this our home needs to be a place where it's beautiful and it's inviting and it makes us feel comfortable. It's not just a place to sleep. Um, over time, um, as, as we've you know purchased homes and found new places to live, I still default more to is it functional. I'm learning more and I'm 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 valuing more beauty over functionality. Um, you know, Scott and I were talking before we we um, started recording here and. Uh, we each took a week off and we both spent some time improving our house. I was shocked to feel that that was actually rejuvenating and that was vacation to me. Um, and it really came full circle a couple nights ago when we could sit on the back patio and eat dinner together and the garden was in full bloom and it was comfortable. Um, and, you know, there was a couple days where we spent all day outside on the patio playing games, reading, napping, because we'd created that space. Um, that was a symbol that as I understood more why my spouse, that symbol was important to her. Um, at first it was, okay, I can support you in this. I don't really care either way, but I'll support you in this. And then it became to be a symbol that's important for me now um, and meaningful for me now and something that we both agree on, something that we work together to enhance and, and build together. That symbolism in your relationship um, at its best is we both understand this, we've worked to understand this, and we work to create this symbol to be what it is. Um, that's, that's maybe as good as it gets. I think for the most part, when it comes to a difference in how we view symbols, the best that we're able to do is to get to a place where we can appreciate, support, and honor the symbol for, for your partner. Um, in In, Kind of an outline of what to work on your marriage and when symbols is something that comes after learning how to do conflict and after regulating your emotions and getting sober and things like that because it really is to say it's an icing on the cake i think kind of um take some of the value out of it out of it um but at the same time it's kind of that lifelong pursuit together if you're in an organization if you work in an organization with coworkers for a long time you have artifacts and symbols and over time, those become more meaningful, more of a, a, a place of connection together. It becomes something that's special to just that relationship. And it's one of the benefits to being part of that relationship. Um, we share the same jokes. We share the same meaning. Um, we share the same experiences. And those become things that set this relationship apart from the people that we meet at the grocery store or um, anybody else it kind of it helps create i think some of that protective bubble around the relationship um, that keeps it fresh that keeps us engaged um, and and keeps us learning about each other so that is symbols in relationship thanks john that's a really interesting topic i've, I've not heard anybody really talk about it that way but when you say symbols in a relationship i immediately go to the wedding ring um, and, and, and things that are like really obvious about, you know, I'm committed, you know, like Facebook status, things like that. Um, but you're kind of talking about more, I mean, not that that's not deep and meaningful, but you know, your wife creating a plaque and your kids building the, the, the Star Wars ship with you and, and knowing that it's in your office and wanting it in your office and looking for it. Um, is there a difference between, say, a wedding ring and, you know, the plaque and, and, and the, the, the starship in a relationship? Um, I think there is. I think there's some symbols that are conventional for your culture. And um, most of us grow up, like, I remember the first time I put on my wedding ring and I felt like I was a you know, this, this may not, this may not come from the, you know, most emotionally healthy place, but I felt like a completed man um, with that, like, I am married, I have a spouse, like, we're going to create a family and a life together. 
Um, and I think about that often, but that wasn't a symbol that the two of us picked out together and said, this is going to be our thing. That was a, um, that was a cultural convention that carries a lot of meaning. Like for a lot of families, Christmas is the same way. Um, we may have our individual nuances of how we do this, but it's kind of an institution and it's taken on some special meaning. The, the Star Wars ship, um, one of the reasons why it's so meaningful to me is because it was spontaneously created and given a lot of meaning, not just by me, but by the people I created the symbol with. Um, and so I think there is some difference. I don't think it's a matter of which one's more powerful. It's more like the, the origin story. Some of these relationship symbols tie us in with a long tradition that we're happy to be a part of. Some of them are a brand new tradition. Um, you know, my, my 10 year old asked me, his, his birthday is coming up and he asked me the other day, he's like, are we gonna do the Lego set thing? And I said, well, do you still want it? And he said, I'm not really into Legos, but I like picking them out and building them with you. Um, and that's something I think when he's 33, I'll still buy him a Lego set for his birthday and we'll sit down and build it together. Um, it, it's that nobody else has this. Um, so, so there's value in being part of something that is kind of enshrined in culture and it's a long line that we're passing down and there's value in we struck out on our own and we created something that's meaningful and special to us. Yeah, that's, I love the creating symbols together that are, are meaningful only to you. Um, you know, everybody has a wedding ring when I don't, I'm not that married, but you know, you're sort of part of a club there and it's a big club, but you know, having the starship in your office, it's, it's really personal and, and mm -hmm. private in a, in a way. So um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I'm gonna ask um, the people here, if you have a symbol that's meaningful in, in your life and your relationship and you wanna share it in the chat feature, please do, um, which I think would be kind of interesting to see what other people's symbols are. Oh, what they to them. Um, but um, let's let's dive into our Q&A. So ask us questions about anything. It can be about symbols or just relationships in general. Um, most of you are here because you're either an addict and you're in a relationship or you're the partner of an addict and you're in a relationship. <laughs> Lots of questions to ask about that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, first question here um, is a um, strange question, but how would uh, you react when your spouse is rudely attacked by a shop employee twice in the same day. I'm wondering how a healthy husband would react. Um, if my reaction was over-exaggerated later, I will tell you how he reacted if you're wondering. So, um, John, if you're at Starbucks and um, an employee there is rude to your wife twice in the same day, what are you gonna do? Interesting. Yeah, um, the I'll I'll put one caveat on this, but the what is a healthy reaction? Understand that a healthy reaction is a wide spectrum. Um, as I'm as I'm looking at this, um, and I'm putting myself in this position, like I would feel angry, and I I think if I were in that position, um, like the Starbucks employee, like you said, Scott, I think that employee would know that I was angry. And I would probably demonstrate that through my body language. I would probably demonstrate that through some words. Um, as I look at kind of the, the healthy aspect of that, for me, um, regulation in all, in all situations is of the utmost importance to me. Um, when I become dysregulated on somebody else's behalf or because of somebody else's action, what I've discovered through my own recovery is that that's giving away my power and it usually doesn't stop there in that moment. Um, so that would, that employee would know that I was, I was angry. I might ask to talk to a manager. Um, I might even look at the employee and say, what the hell is this about? Um, and, but ultimately I think I would leave before there was a scene. Um, and I probably wouldn't go back to that Starbucks and I would probably let somebody know why. And that's, that's what my reaction would look like. Um, that whole regulation thing, uh, that's something for all of my clients we're working on from day one, um, especially when addiction is involved, um, self-regulation and 
um, thinking things through before acting impulsively are not a strong suit for a lot of addicts, go figure. Um, and, and so depending on where, where a person's at in recovery or emotional maturity or self-awareness, um, the reaction is going to look really, really different. For me, the, the gold standard in those kind of situations are, did you stay regulated throughout or did you lose it? Um, and if you lost it, can you engage with why? Why did you lose it in that way? Where does that come from? Do you want to do something about it? An interesting question. Yeah, you know, as, as, as a person in recovery, I think back to my active addiction and, and early recovery when I'm still very, very crazy. Not that I'm not now, but, um, you know, I would, um, I don't like mayonnaise. Uh, it, make, it just makes me gag. Um, so certain fast food restaurants serve um, their burgers with mayonnaise. So I would say, please, no mayonnaise. And I would lie and say, I'm allergic. Um, which, not true, but I did not want mayonnaise. And I was you know, giving them a really good reason to not have mayonnaise. And if my sandwich came out with mayonnaise, I would go crazy. Um, and, you know, like, you're trying to kill me. And, blah, 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 and I'd be with the manager. And, you know, as part of my recovery, you know, I try to back away from those crazy conflicts. Um, and it's interesting. I'm wondering if I think I'm more likely to react and get angry um, if I'm with someone who's getting abused in some way than if I'm getting abused in some way, um, which is interesting. But I, I, I would like to think that I would react the way, the way that John just described, but I'm not sure. Um, I haven't been confronted with that. And, and um, it would be hard for me to watch somebody I care about, you know, get raked over the coals for some reason. And there's so so one of the comments that came up here is, is speaking to that. What about empathizing and acknowledging the wife in a shared expression between the couple? Another example of a, a healthy way to cope with that. You've just been through something. Is my attention going to go to it? It's like the old, you know, you're you're hiking and your your partner's bitten by a poisonous snake. Do you chase down the snake or do you attend to your partner? Um, part of the healthy expression there would be, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay with this? I just noticed X, Y, Z. Um, let's turn into each other. Let's lean into each other and re-regulate our system after this. That's another really good option. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really nice thought. Um, we have one in the, in the chat feature here. Um, um, this goes back to my, my question about symbols, and, and it's, this person says, many of our created symbols are negative. Um, there are not many positive symbols in our history, or we attach very different meanings to our symbols. What's positive for one person may be negative to the other. Do you, do you see the negative symbols and, and the differing opinions on symbols, and, and how can a couple sort of work through that? This is a really, really great point. Um, yeah, created symbols aren't just a positive thing. And I would say often when we create our symbols unconsciously, um, it's, it's a crapshoot at best, whether or not it's going to be a positive uh, symbol. You have to be intentional about it. So for a lot of couples in recovery, um, that's a place to start, especially I'm, I'm thinking of one couple that I worked with. Um, he had had an affair with uh, one of her coworkers. Um, they, they worked at a, a gymnastics gym together and their kids were on the same gymnastics team. Um, so this, this affair partner had left the employee of that gym soon after um, the affair came out, but the kids were still involved with it. So they were coming up on this competition um, where they knew the affair partner was going to be there because her kids were competing and um, they didn't feel like it was the right thing to ask her to stay away because her kids were there and she had a right to be there. But they had to talk about how do we want to do this different. The symbol that they had around those meets were he was annoyed that he had to spend so much time because his spouse was working at the meet and it wasn't just he could show up like all the other parents. So that was the symbol they created before is this was a you don't support me in my job and your job takes over everything. So they talked about it and they said, what we want this to be for us is we want, we want to claim this as our space. So we know the affair partner is going to be there. And she said, 
I, it would mean a lot to me if you could stay close to me and keep your arm around me, almost like, hey, this is my relationship. We are together. And they were in a place where that had meaning to them. And so they went through almost every aspect of what this day was going to look like. And they talked about the things they were going to do to check in with each other. Um, you know, we're going to make sure that we kiss hello. We're going to make sure there's an arm around each other. We're going to make sure we eat lunch together. Um, I'm going to sit right next to you at the scorer's table. So they very intentionally created the symbol around something that had been negative and had been destructive. Um, and it was a, it was a point of great healing for them and a kind of a change in momentum for their relationship. They started talking about most things in those terms. When we go out to dinner tonight, what do we want this to look like? When we celebrate this holiday, how is this going to be meaningful to you? Um, it, it is very often in these, these unconsciously created symbols that we may feel two different ways about it. You may love the symbol and your spouse might hate it. Um, that again is where it's important to talk through, know why you feel differently about it. Because um, in the understanding that we seek there it actually often becomes less about how do we execute this thing and more about what are the principles at play here why does this have meaning for you or why does this carry pain for you and it's in that that if the symbol can be changed we can consciously change it together or if it can be reconstructed we can reconstruct it together or if it can't be avoided we can care for each other through those painful spots um, you know, I, I think of Christmas a lot. That's, that's a symbol that my spouse and I do not agree on um, in large part. Um, we've certainly put a lot of work into understanding what each other needs in that. So when we're on our fifth hour of sitting at somebody's house and talking about Christmas memories and I'm climbing up the wall, um, I can reorient to... Um, to my spouse and we can have a little side conversation or she can reorient to me and be okay with me going out to take a walk and spending some time by myself. Um, it's not how either of us prefer to spend the holiday, but we understand where each other are coming from. And it doesn't have to be, not every symbol has to carry the exact same meaning as long as we keep, each, keep up with each other through it. And as long as we're okay keeping up, up with each other through it. Again, when it comes to things like home, love, and money, there needs to be more agreement than disagreement on those symbols. Um, otherwise, uh, you're, you're in for a lot of heartache. But a lot of other symbols we have flexibility in and we can, we can create and, um, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we can configure those in any way that we need to. So um, by the way, people ask us questions, use the Q&A feature. We've got one waiting, but um, I wanted to ask a question um, and I'll, I'll kind of give some background since, since we were on Christmas um, and it's July, so we're going to have Christmas in July here for a moment. Uh, when I was growing up, um, my mother um, was a little bit crazy, um, mostly from anxiety, anxiety and narcissism, and it just manifested in a lot of crazy ways. And um, one of them was at Christmas time was we had to have the most decorations of anybody on the planet. It was, you know, Chevy Chase's, you know, house, but inside, not outside. And, you know, there were three or four different Christmas trees and, and they looked like big conical piles of ornaments. You couldn't even see the tree. And there were just everywhere were Santa Clauses and snowmen and this and that and the other. And it made me crazy. Um, you know, just but no idea what our house looked like for like, you know, and it started in you know, like October. Um, and so one year when I was, away, it just drove me crazy. One year when I was away at college, I said, mom, please don't put any Christmas decorations in my room. I just need a nice, serene, normal space when I come home. And, and so she said she had put one Santa Claus in my room just to acknowledge it's Christmas. And I got home and there were like 23 Santa Clauses in my room. And she rationalized for like 20 minutes to me how this was really only one. Um, well, that one doesn't count, you know, it was just, you know, so is, is it any wonder I became an addict, you know, um, one, you know, one is too many, a thousand is not enough. Um, and so as an adult, I, I became the Grinch. Um, no Christmas decorations, none of this stuff. It's stupid and this and that and the other. Um, but my experience when I finally bought a home and that became a symbol for me, uh, uh, it was a symbol of my recovery to have a home. 
because you know I was not spending money on real estate when I was in my addiction. Um, and suddenly I found myself wanting to decorate for Christmas and just put up a tree, like a Christmas tree, you know, with ornaments. Um, and it, the meaning of Christmas decorations has really changed for me. The symbol of that has changed for me. It means something different now. Um, but I, I, I had to sort of consciously re reclaim it. Can couples do that with negative symbols? Can they consciously reclaim it and turn it positive? Absolutely. Um, sometimes a negative symbol becomes negative because it is just imbued in every ounce with so much toxicity and neither of us want anything to do with it. Um, oftentimes what we'll see is it's more, uh, there's contamination of part of it and there's a longing for, I, I still want to have this, I just don't want these associations. Um, and it's, it's, again, important to work together collaboratively, conscientiously, and intentionally to do what's needed um, to reclaim that symbol. Um, much like with, with your house, Scott, when you want to decorate for Christmas, um, you could have followed programming or what was, what was presented to you before and like, okay, it's all or nothing. Or you could say, I want one tree and that's how I'm going to do this. And this is mine. This is my expression of, of the holiday and the feelings. And I'm, I, I love this. Um, couples definitely can work together to reclaim those symbols. Okay. Um, we've got some Q and A stuff here. Um, thank you. Um, um, on the other hand, in the Starbucks situation, if the husband, the observing spouse displays anger, displays anger at the wife, the hurt spouse, because the employee was rude to her and she's experiencing feelings over it, then what? Um, how can the couple uh, re-regulate re themselves? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question because I've seen that. Um, you're mean to my wife and then I get mad at my wife because I don't know why, but, but I do. There's, there's the key and the, the part I'm gonna focus on here is how do we re-regulate ourselves relationally? First of all, we have to check out a lot of assumptions. Um, I, I'll, I'll raise my hand. I've been the husband in that situation who's been upset that my, my spouse is experiencing feelings. Um, and really what's underneath it, and it takes some, takes some willingness on my part and some pushing to get to what's really underneath it, I felt powerless. I felt like an idiot that I didn't say something sooner. I was standing there right beside you and this happened twice. Um, that's why I'm angry. And, and that anger is coming out at you because you're showing me that you're hurt. And I, I want you to make it okay by not being hurt by this. I should have been there to stop it. So first you have to check out the assumptions. Um, are you really just angry at me? Um, or are you really angry? Are you feeling helpless? Are you feeling out of control? Are you feeling regretful? Like um, the, the, the first step to get to in re-regulating is knowing exactly what it is we're dealing with. Um, the surface story may be X happened, now we're dealing with Y and we're going to be stuck in Z forever. And that may be what, what happened on the surface, but underneath we may be actually dealing with some really different, different components. So see if you can become aware of what those different components are so you can actually deal with it. If, if you're the, the spouse in here that is upset, um, if there's some feelings of powerlessness and helplessness, part of the re-regulating is attending to those just as much as the hurt feelings. You know, if the two of you are standing together and having an otherwise, you know, nice day and this rude employee um, blows things up for you, you're both victims of that. Um, you're both in need of some help there. Um, you're both part of a situation that was bigger than you and, and you, you both have a legitimate need there. Um, so, so the first step is take some time to figure out exactly what happened and then reestablish one of the most valuable, uh, assets in any relationship is when you can say, no, at the end of the day, you have my back. Even if we disagree on this, even if we're not seeing eye to eye right now, I know we're going to end up back to back on this again, and I'll feel that support. Um, so, so setting that intention, what do we want to have come out of this? Well, at the end of this, I don't want you to feel hurt anymore. And I want you to feel like I'm, I'm there for you. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe I want you to feel 
that this isn't your fault and that I understand that things happen that are outside of your control. And I'm not expecting you to stop that stuff from happening. I just want you to be here for me. Okay, that's where we want to end up. Now, how do we get there? Maybe we need some time to breathe and to come down. That's really upsetting that somebody assaulted us in that way. Um, maybe we need to talk through and vent. So I'm going to tell you my raw feelings and I know that this is coming from a distorted place and I know that this is not how I'm going to feel later, but I need to get it out. I need to do my, Brene Brown refers to it as the SFD or the shitty first draft. Um, maybe I need to get that out. And so I can really start grappling with the feelings that are under there. So um, but that, that starts with know exactly where you're starting. Take the time to figure that out. Re reiterate to each other where we want to end up and then fill in the in-between. Yeah, you know, um, sometimes there's a saying in recovery called first thought wrong, um, you know, because my, and, and especially for people in early recovery, you know, first, first thought, first word, first reaction, probably not always my best thought, my best reaction. Um, so yeah, that shitty first draft is, is um, and, and as I've gotten, you know, stronger in my recovery and had more practice, you know, I can stop myself from having, you know, the shitty first draft. I can recognize it for what it is, back away, have another thought and, and proceed. But it really takes a lot of practice. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so um, got a couple questions here. Um, this relates back to the couple at the gymnastics meet um, that, that you shared about. Um, my husband and I are trying to reclaim our neighborhood beach restaurants and hotels in our immediate area uh, that he shared with the married woman who was a new friend of mine, which made it more hurtful, uh, very understandable. Um, for example, they shared a couple of nights sitting on the same beach where my kids like to go surfing. Um, so yeah, in, in, on a broad scale, how do you reclaim your, <laughs> your life? Um, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the first part, yeah, I think it can definitely be applied if there's a, a couple things. Both of you have to be willing to face what's there. Um, the husband in this gymnastics situation, he had to be able to look at his affair partner with his wife by his side and not become so consumed by his shame that he couldn't attend to her. So he had to be willing to feel the shame that was going on for him that was inherent. He had to do some preparatory work because that was going to be triggering for him, not triggering in the way that, oh my gosh, I want to be with her, but more triggering the way like I did that. And that's who I did that with. Um, so so in, in this case, I'd say the, the husband has to be willing to confront the shame that follows him into those places. Um, as, as the spouse here, if you want to reclaim it and do some of that work, you have to confront some of the insecurity that's going to follow you into some of those places. And as is often the case with you know, something blooming beautifully, there's struggle. If you've ever watched a seed, um, a seed uh, root and, and, and bloom in time lapse, it's a violent process. Um, there's, there's struggle, there's push. Um, and that's for, for this couple, as much as they had planned, the day of the gymnastics meet was still really hard. Um, it took them a couple days after to be, actually be able to determine, okay, that was a victory. You know, we, we did that. Um, because there was a lot going on and their commitment to both to each other was we're going to, we're going to hang through this together. Um, we're going to talk about what's coming up. And they had a lot of accountability around that, a lot of commitment around that. Um, so I, my, my recommendation would be there and reclaiming any of these. It's not a one person endeavor. Um, it really is a partnership. If you want to reclaim those and not just neutralize the symbol, but if you want to make it special again, um, it, it really is a, a two-person endeavor. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about the beach. Your kids like to surf there. I mean, maybe the whole family goes to the beach and has a day there and the kids surf and there's a cookout. And, you know, the whole family reclaims it. Maybe the kids don't know what, what's happening, but, you know, you and your husband do uh, or something like that. And it seems to me you would have to almost reclaim one spot at a time and process yeah. and because and, it's, yeah. Well, and honestly... Not, I've seen some rituals like burning sage or cleansing an area. I've seen that be a helpful symbol. Um, you know, even if there were mementos from the relationship that haven't been surrendered already or like burning a letter or a picture or something like that in the presence, like we are 
symbolically cleansing this area and the energy around it. Um, but I, I like what you said, Scott, about almost like piece by piece, it has to be reclaimed. That's part of the hard work of returning. Your first trip back to the beach may not be the day of the beach that you wanted it to be. But if we really want that to be special, we have to show up again and we have to do cleanup again. Think about it as an oil spill on the beach. Um, oil spills don't ruin beaches forever, um, but it's a, it's a lot of work, a lot of coming back again and again to make sure it gets cleaned up. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna skip down one question and then we'll go back up. Um, I've been in a new relationship for the past, past four months, but I'm battling with porn and sexting addiction. Um, I've tried to battle this, but ultimately I always relapse after a few days of sobriety, not shared this with him, the new partner, and I don't believe I can uh, just yet as I carry a lot of shame on this behavior. Um, it's unfair to him since my sexual energy is often directed elsewhere. He's a great guy. And I constantly feel bad due to my behavior. <laughs> um, so this is a relatively new relationship, four months uh, in this yeah. individual, I don't know if this is from a male or female, um, has not shared about it with, the, with this new partner and is also feeling bad um, and feeling a lot of shame and, you know, and just feeling bad about not giving everything to the relationship that it probably deserves. Um, there's a there's a short term and a long term answer to this, and both of them are needed. Um, it's it's clear to me from the way that this is written, as you know, that there has to be a day of reckoning with a partner. Like you can't do this secret behavior and, and be in a relationship in good conscience. You also know that you're not ready for that day of reckoning. Um, you may not have the courage. You may not have the commitment. You may not have the follow through. You might just be terrified um, about being dishonest with somebody else about a dark part. So the short term answer is go to meetings, get accountable, talk to somebody, tell somebody the truth about what's going on and work hard to stop it. If you want to have these relationships without this um, porn and sexting addiction getting in the way, you have to stop um, ultimately. So that's the, that's the short term answer is get yourself the support and the help that you need so that you can stop the behavior, you can stop actively betraying the people that you're in a relationship with, you can look at yourself in the mirror and be proud of who you are um, and not have this cloud following you around. Um, what, I, what I see often with people who start showing up and, and coming to their own assistance in that way is they develop the courage to get honest in their relationships. Um, that's again, some of that hard work, that's the oil spill on the beach that we have to go back to and clean up um, again and again more than once. Um, but I, I see the people who are able to do that work long term, they have groups and accountability and sponsors and people that they're honest with and feel supported by in that. Um, and that's, that's the long term answer is um, you have to get to a place eventually if you want these intimate long term relationships where you're just honest um, in there. It's easier to be honest when you're not out of control and, and engaged in behavior that you know is betraying. Um, but even if you are, it's important to be honest in committed relationships. So work first on that short term, get the support you need so you can have the courage and the follow through to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, as you, as you get that stability under you, focus on um, honesty and integrity and alignment in, in your relationships. Um, and there's lots and lots of options. I'm glad you're here at a sex and relationship healing um, webinar. There's a lot of different drop-in groups and webinars that can be helpful to you. There's 12-step meetings, there's smart recovery. Um, there are so many places you can go to get help there. Yeah, just, just a little bit about the nature of porn addiction and sex addiction and, and sexting and all this stuff. These are intensity addictions. Um, they amp it up. It, you know, we get a huge adrenaline and dopamine rush when we're looking at porn or when we're sexting or when we're swiping left or right or whatever it is we do. Um, and um, it affects our brains. Um, our brains get used to this constant slamming of the dopamine and, and they adjust. Our brains are kind of amazing. They heal, basically. I'm getting too much dopamine and adrenaline activity. I'm going to shut down the receptors. I'm going to produce less dopamine and less adrenaline. So suddenly, you know, the porn doesn't, it, instead of being up here, it's down here. And the sexting, instead of being here, it's down here. 
And so we either have to look at more of it or more intense versions of it. Um, so that's called escalation. So it, it, it builds and builds and builds. All addictions do this, but it's so visible, particularly with porn and sexting and sex. Um, it's just incredibly visible. The things that I looked at when I first started looking at porn are so boring now that I have to look at this and then this and then this, and suddenly I'm violating my values. And I, you know, um, on top of this, as our brain adjusts, it doesn't just adjust the dopamine and adrenaline related to porn and sex and sexting. It affects everything. So I can no longer get the same play. You know, chocolate cake used to be here. Now it's here. You know, I no longer get the same pleasure from anything. Um, and this will impact a relationship with a real world person. You know, one real world person is not going to provide the dopamine adrenaline rush that a constant stream of constantly changing porn is going to provide. Um, and this manifests um, physically and emotionally. Physically for men, um, you know, we talk to 16, 17, 18, 18 year old kids are having uh, erectile dysfunction. They can't get it up. Um, they've got a girlfriend and she wants to have sex and, you know, they can't. Um, but they have no problem when they're looking at porn because it's a bigger intensity. Um, and then with women, there's just, you know, I don't, as I said, I don't know if this question's from a, a male or a female, but, you know, this question specifically says, my sexual energy is often directed elsewhere. And, you know, that can be mentally, psychologically, emotionally, and even physically. Um, it's, it's more directed toward the porn and the sex scene because it's more intense. Um, so yeah, porn addiction is really tough on relationships um, um, from a sexual standpoint because it affects your ability to perform. I mean, Pat, uh, Pat Carnes, who's sort of the father of sex addiction, um, said one of the ironies is that sex addicts are, tend to be really bad at sex. Um, and this is why. Um, so yeah, I, I just found this a really interesting question. John, I don't know how, if you have any thoughts on that or not, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, as evidence, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to your response, Scott, and it's just reminding me there is so much packed into getting into recovery. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you don't wait until you understand it all and have a perfect plan. You have to dive in somewhere and get started because it is so big and it is so pervasive in, in your life. Um, this person in the, the chat, they asked a follow-up question, any recommendations, They're, they live out of the country, any recommendations for online gay sex addiction meetings? Um, I'll defer to you on that, Scott, because I, I think you might know a little better than I do. Just, just for the record, I'm gay um, and I'm a sex addict. So um, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. I was gonna bring it up because I definitely wanted us to answer that. Um, there are a lot of online, uh, sexual recovery meetings, um, not just in person. Um, what I want to say is that whether you're gay or straight, um, you should be able to find support. Um, stay away from, if you're gay, stay away from Sexaholics Anonymous. Um, you will not feel welcome there. Um, but there are two other uh, groups with lots of offerings. One is Sex Addicts Anonymous and the other is Sexual Compulsives Anonymous. Um, they're both very gay friendly. Sexual Compulsives Anonymous, a lot of the meetings are entirely gay, um, but you know, straight people filter in and women filter in uh, because they feel safe around a bunch of gay men who aren't hitting on them you know, and, and triggering their sex addiction. Um, sex Addicts Anonymous tends to be a real mix of uh, tends to be a real mix of gay and straight men and women, um, but very supportive. Um, and particularly online meetings um, tend to be like a little less triggering, I think. Um, but I would look for Sex Addicts Anonymous, just go onto their website and Sexual Compulsives Anonymous, go onto their website, find the online meetings, you're good to go. Um, and we actually do have a gay men's uh, discussion group on Tuesday nights? I think it's tonight. It might be Monday nights. I can't remember. On uh, sexandrelationshiphealing.com, we have a discussion group specifically for gay male sex addicts. Um, so definitely check that out too. I was going to ask, I thought I thought SRA had, um, or 
sex and relationship healing. I thought they had a, a gay men's discussion group. Um, that, those would be my same recommendations for 12 step groups. Um, I've also found um, in smart recovery, it's not a 12 step based. Um, it's more based in um, cognitive psychology and behavior change. Um, there tends to be less of a push and pull between gay dynamics because it's, uh, it's, it's strictly looking at how you're thinking and how you're living your life and, and teaching skills for that. So the thing I love about phone meetings, actually, most of the time when I refer people to meetings, I encourage them to start in the phone meetings, especially if they have excuses, legitimate or not, about, you know, my work schedule's weird or, you know, there's not meetings in my area. Um, you can find phone meetings virtually around the clock um, between several different fellowships and several different organizations. So especially where you're in another country on the other side of the world, um, there, there are a lot of options. I would just say um, pick some in those guidelines that Scott gave you and just get brave and start showing up. Um, yeah, I, I know for sure that SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, has some European-based meetings, yeah. so they're going to be a little bit closer to your time zone. Uh, you know, if you get yeah. something, that, you know, halfway around the world, it's tougher. Uh, I taught a work group, you know, for six weeks, and uh, one of the guys got up at 2 a.m. in New Zealand <laughs> so he could take this work group, um, yeah. you know, which I was like, I was very impressed by that, but yeah, it wasn't convenient for him. <laughs> But you can find some that are convenient for you, definitely. Yeah. And, yeah, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, I wanted to ask this question too. Um, this is, goes back to symbols. Um, can you speak more toward uh, symbols of love and money in a couple's relationship? Um, what are some examples of those? We mostly talked about home. We did talk a lot about love, but yeah. So let's let's start with love. Um, while this is not a scientific and research validified validated approach most people know what the love languages are that's an example of the symbol of love i may represent it with you in time that i spend with you and you may look for it in gifts given or words of affirmation or something like that um, so so the symbols around love are, are both about how we give and receive it and also about what it means for us um, does love always mean staunch loyalty, even if that means like covering up the sins and misdeeds of the person that you love? Um, I, I, I remember, so my, my older sister was married two and a half weeks after I was. And so we've kind of, we've kind of grown up um, in our marriages together. And I remember early on, it was probably in the first year of marriage, we, we got our siblings together and we were having a game night. And um, we were playing a game that requires cooperation between the players, but it's not mandatory. Like you can win by going scorched earth or you can win by being cooperative and supportive with each other. So you make your own decisions there. And um, her, my sister's husband decided to make a trade with me over her. And she didn't talk to him for a week after that. Um, I, I learned this from, from talking to him because we watched the interaction. I was like, oh man, this is, he's like, oh, we didn't talk for a week. And when they talked, um, for her, it came down to this is how you support me and you show me that you love me is in any situation, you have my back above anybody else's. Now he was looking at it and saying, it's just a game. It's okay if I win. It's okay if you win. Like, it's just a game. But it didn't mean that to her. Um, they, they've had to learn about that. Um, symbols around money, again, similarly, um, it, it can be about what money means itself. Does it mean power? Does it mean opportunity? It can be about what we do with our money. So, you know, in, in my own relationship, um, I am natively more of a miser and more of a hoarder when it comes to money. Um, my bank account will never be full enough. And um, my spouse is of the opinion that um, money is a tool that opens opportunities to enjoy life. So money spent on experiences, on beautiful things, on improving the space around you. Um, for her, that's just as good as money in the bank. Um, and that's, that's another thing through my relationship that I've had to work really hard to understand. And she's had to work hard to understand and we've had to learn how to compromise um, on that. Um, so, uh, a lot of a lot of couples will get in fights around money around how is it spent 
not why do we want to spend it that way? And that's really, uh, that's really where the money's at in those money conversations is why do you want to spend it that way? And just because is not an adequate answer. You really have to get into what are your hopes, your dreams, what's important to you here. Um, and as you're listening to your spouse talk about that, you have to suspend the judgment and say, well, that's stupid. I never spend my money in that way. And you have to really move to a place of understanding why the value is there for them. Why do they think this experience is worth $300? Um, because my, my opinion with, with money, for most people, it does hold some kind of value. It's not the same value. So you may look at an experience that you'd be willing to spend no more than $10 on and your spouse says, this is priceless, I'll spend whatever on. That's not really about the value of money. That's about what the money, what, what experiences the money opens them up to. Um, you know, I, I took when I, we took our family to Disneyland um, right before COVID officially hit. Um, and uh, it's a ridiculous amount of money. And if I just look at the money spent, I'm like, I, you know, Europe is more worth it to me. So many things are more worth it to me. But at the end of the day, my kids living out their dreams for, you know, with all of the characters they grew up with and are in love with for three days, like money well spent. Um, but I, I hope that's some concrete examples of, of examples of the symbols around love and money. Yeah, we could probably spend an entire hour talking about love and money. <laughs> it just, uh, yeah. Um, nothing creates more conflict in a relationship than money, I think, other than cheating. <laughs> so um, we're actually out of time. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, John. Um, great topic today. Very cool. Very interesting and something that I've never uh, had discussions about before. So thank you so much. Awesome. Anything you want to say to take us out? Um, just thanks everybody for coming. I really love the questions and the discussion. I'll look forward to this next time. Yeah, we'll see you in two weeks. So have, have, a, have, a, have a great day, week, whatever. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody.